and I will be your presenter for the next two hours. Really glad that you could be here. So let me start and say that this course is being, um, is being set up by the Prevention Technology Transfer Center Network. You can see that at the top of the slide. And it's funded by SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And I know that there are a number of prevention technology transfer centers throughout the country. The one that is, is providing this training is the one that is at Rutgers and at the School of Social Work. So I work for another organization. I'll tell you about it later on. It's the ATTC. But Claire Neary, who's our contact there, we have a contract with them and we're really glad to be working with them. So glad that you are all here. So a couple of things. Been through the commercial. Uh, we do a variety of um, webinars, and if there's topic areas that you would want, you can let Claire Neary know, and she'll set it up with with us. So anyway, that's just kind of the beginning. Let's go to the next slide. Anytime we do one of our trainings, we have to have a disclaimer, and what it says is, and I'll kind of read it word for word. Uh, the development of these training materials was supported by a grant by M. Chapel, Mike Chapel. He's our supervisor. He's my supervisor at the ATTC. And the main thing about this is that even though it's funded by SAMHSA, that the contents are solely the responsibility of the Northeast and Caribbean Addiction Technology Transfer Center and do not necessarily represent the official views of SAMHSA. So the ATTC of the Northeast and Caribbean is the organization that I work for. We're located in New York City. Uh, we used to be hanging out at the New York State Psychiatric Institute of Columbia. Medical College, although we have been hanging out at our homes since whenever, since March. So glad again that you are here. Another piece that I'll do, and again, you'll see this in all the trainings um, that we do, whether it's from our office in New York or when we're working for the PTTC at Rutgers. And I think this is an important piece and if you're in school, you maybe learn this, or if you're looking at recovery-oriented systems and recovery-oriented language, we always have to look at, as it says there, people first. So often, in my first week in grad school, which was many years ago, they told us, remember, that you always say the person with the disability, you don't say the disability first. So it's the person with substance use. It is the person with mental health, the person living with HIV, as opposed to Let's talk about that person. And I was talking to a nurse recently and she was told the same thing. So she couldn't refer to people who by their, uh, why they're in the hospital. So she couldn't say, well, the appendix in room 403 and she was corrected and was told to say, the person who had their appendix removed is in 403. So um, we'll talk about that um, as we go on, on, but I think it's an important value of the work that many of us do. So I'll tell you briefly about myself and why I'm doing this course. One, I'm not a scientist. I am a vocational rehabilitation counselor by trade, which means that I used to work in drug treatment and actually with people with a co-occurring disorders. And I help them in terms of employment, either going back to their jobs and or going to get new jobs. And I always went to case conference and the psychiatrists were always talking about different medications and they'd say things like, well, you know that this increases dopamine or this deals with reuptake of a certain neurotransmitter. And I didn't always know what they were talking about. So it became kind of an interest of mine. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to really share this so that if you're at a case conference or a doctor's telling you information that you'll kind of understand why some of the medications work. Now, I also know that you are, many of you are working in prevention and how do we connect neurochemistry to prevention? Very easily. Uh, what'll happen too, as we go through is we'll look at the ways of different neurotransmitters for adolescents. Uh, we'll look at some of the neurotransmitters that older people have 
and it may help you in terms of, you know, do you want to look at some of those things if you're setting up a prevention program. So, all right, so what are we going to do today? Uh, the goal, and again, this is a basic course. As I said, I'm a rehabilitation counselor. I'm not a scientist. And if you are in nursing school or going to med school, um, some of the information that you get or some of the pictures are gonna, going to be looking probably a lot different. We are going to keep it simple. So we'll review the basics of neurochemistry, especially as it applies to substance use and some co-occurring disorders. We have people from state of Washington too. Welcome. Indiana, cool. If I didn't say your state, by the way, please don't take it personally. I know there's a lot of people um, on here, but I think it's really cool when we get people from all over the world. And so we talk, this is gonna be the basic goal today. And as I said at the beginning, I think some of you I recognize from working in treatment and the PTTC really focuses on prevention. So we'll look at how you can also use this information maybe in programming and also for understanding that pe the people that you work with. You know, we always hear things about the brain of an adolescent versus the brain of an adult, and we'll talk about that. Um, so that is something to um, keep um, in mind. Now, here's the objectives. We will be talking about identifying the neuron as the basic building block of the central nervous system. And we'll talk about what the central nervous system is. Uh, we'll look at some of those neurotransmitters. Uh, some of you are familiar with these, but things like dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Even if you watch television, which I have to admit I do a lot, that you'll see even commercials that really talk about serotonin or when there's uh, different kinds of drugs, they'll tell you something about the neurotransmitters. We'll also look at the three parts of the brain. And again, many there's many parts of the brain. We're gonna do the keep it simple way. And we'll look at the cortex, the limbic system, and the brain stem and how they work together around the use of substances. And then we'll look at, okay, how can you use this information either for yourself and also for your clients and for anybody that might be helpful. So it's going to be really kind of the keep it simple. So I like to keep it simple sometimes. And, you know, we talk about neurochemistry. So I, looked this up before I redid this course a couple of months ago and thought, well, what is neurochemistry? And here's what you get from the dictionary on, on the internet. It's the study of the chemical composition and processes of the nervous system. Now, what does that mean in plain English? Um, the central nervous system really is, it's about the brain and the spinal cord, and we'll be going over that. And we'll also look, why do we need to look at this is because the alcohol and other drugs when are used, they affect the neurochemical system. So that's the basic introduction or the basic definition of what is neurochemistry. I just want to say a couple of other things before I go to the next slide. So we're, we'll be talking about the central nervous system. You know, sometimes you see it, uh, it's abbreviated CNS, and we'll talk about how that is part of the brain actually in the spinal cord, that's what it's composed of. But there's another term you'll also hear, which is called the peripheral nervous system. I'm not gonna be talking about that as much, but it's really the rest of the body. So the nervous system is obviously very complicated and um, we'll be talking about kind of what you need to know. So, Here's what the central nervous system is. I've already said this, and it's really uh, the brain and the spinal cord, and it's the command post. So anything, and it says, as it says up there, any kind of movement, thoughts, emotion, breathing, heart rate, body temperature goes through the central nervous system. And, you know, why do we need to know this? So the central nervous system carries all sensory information. And sometimes it does it without you thinking. You know, you put your hand on the stove, and it's hot, you don't think, oh, I better take my hand off. No, you just take your hand off uh, because the central nervous system has kicked in and it's giving you that message to get your hand off. 
Um, it also organizes actually any kind of motor flow. So it has to do a lot with walking and um, also provides control of all vital bodily functions, which we'll talk about. It deals with things, for example, when you see the term motor control, we're usually talking about walking. And for those of you who are uh, working with people with disabilities, those are things that, that come up. Another, another piece that it deals with is fine motor control. So fine motor, motor control really has to do with your fingers and what you can do. Now, why do you need to do this? If you are tying your shoe, it involves fine motor control. If you're a hairdresser, you want to have a hairdresser who has good fine motor control. In the old days, it used to be that surgeons had to have good fine motor control. Um, however, now they have all kinds of instruments and they don't have to do it um, as much. But here's what we know about the brain. And we'll be talking about a variety of things like neurons. And so a couple of things around neurons. So the brain is composed of and has 100 billion neurons. How do I know that? I'm looking at a book that you can't see, but it's called The Primer of Drug Action by Dr. Robert Julian. So I'm quoting him. And generally what happens is we know that there are just, when I hear 100 billion, you know, sometimes I hear people have $100 billion. I don't know what that looks like or what that feels like. I just know that it's a lot. And the spinal cord, by the way, goes from uh, the lower end of your brain um, to the sacrum. And one of the things we have to look at, and I'll go to the next page on this, is these are some of the terms you need to know. So neurons really are the building blocks of the central nervous system. And as I said, we have about 100 billion of them. And they are the smallest functional unit um, in our body, or at least in our, in our central nervous system. And part of neurons is they have different parts. They have axons and dendrites. I'll show you a picture on the next page. And what happens is the axon is the sender of the um of the message and the dendrite is the receiver i should say that actually one of the challenges of why we're doing this is that neurons even though we have a hundred billion of them they are not connected so that when there is any kind of message that's going through our body there has to be some kind of some kind of chemicals that help with that let's look on the next page so if by the way for those of you who are teachers this comes from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, or at least that's where I got it on the on the website uh, probably a while ago. And what they have here are, here's our neuron. And so the soma, that is uh, kind of the middle of, of that. And as I said, the axon is going to be sending the message, the dendrite's going to receive. So we have 100 billion of these. Now, what we also know, and this is what we've done with actually a picture of taking two neurons next to each other. This also comes from NIDA. So if they took a microscope and they looked at two neurons together, here's what you might see. So the picture on the top is, is one neuron, the picture on the bottom is the other. Now, what do you need to know about this? There are what are called vesicles. See where it says that you see dopamine and you see an arrow towards what looks like a star. Um, those are, that circle is the vesicles and the vesicles are the homes and they store all the neurotransmitters. And you wanna have neurotransmitters because you wanna feel good. If you had none, or when people kind of lose their ability or have lowering of them, you don't get them. So the vesicles are, are the homes to the neurotransmitters. And what happens is you want to, again, they, they will help. But if you go, what happens is the, the, sorry, I don't know, the dopamine, for example, as a neurotransmitter, when there's a, a chemical message that goes through, the dopamine will go and it will travel to the other neuron. And you can see on the other side, there's receptor sites and there's very specific re uh, receptor sites. And uh, for example, let me just, for the person who can't get the audio, Clyde's gonna help you on that one. So going back to the receptor sites. So there's receptor sites that are very specific 
for specific chemicals. And the job of the neurotransmitter is to travel from one neuron to the other neuron, tap that receptor site, and go back home. And one of the challenges is that when people are using certain substances, the receptor sites can be damaged. And sometimes it takes a while for them to get back uh, into, quote, um, normal. So that's kind of what we're um, looking at. I have another picture on the next one. So that, that process by which a neuron travels from one neuron to another and back is called reuptake. So if you've been in some of your uh, case conferences and they're saying, well, this medication blocks the reuptake of serotonin, that's what it is. So reuptake is the process. It's the process where the neurotransmitters are reabsorbed and you want them to be reabsorbed. Um, and that is an important piece. Now in the middle, uh, and see that like black space is called the synapse. So it's a space and it's a synapse. And what's in that space? Um, there's enzymes there and enzymes jobs are to make sure that there is balance. Challenge is that sometimes what happens is the enzymes create too much balance um, or they destroy too many neurotransmitters and then you don't have any anymore. And that has been um, a challenge. So here's two neurons. You see the one at the top. So when they're sending messages, it goes from one to the other. And this happens obviously without us um, thinking about it. All right, I can't see your faces. So I'm hoping everybody's with me on this one. Uh, let's talk about the brain. Now, again, if you're in medical school, you're gonna be looking at a brain from a different uh, point of view. Break it into um, three parts. Now, the brain is, according to um, some of the books, is about three pounds. And it is, as we know, the command center. And there's different parts of it that I think are important to look at. So if you look at, I'm going to start at the top, looking at the prefrontal cortex. So the cortex really is about judgment and reason. So anytime you think, anytime you plan, anytime you problem solve, anytime you make decisions, sometimes they say it's the quote, executive functioning, you are using your cortex. In the middle, you'll see the limbic system. And the limbic system really, as it says there, deals with all emotions and reward sites. So any kind of, anytime you experience any kind of pleasure, actually any kind of feeling, whether it's anger, sadness, uh, euphoria, joy, you're accessing the limbic system. And many of the dr drugs that people use, actually all drugs really do access the limbic system, including caffeine. So for those of us who like to drink coffee, um, we are also accessing our limbic system. But you'll see, for example, if people are using cocaine or they're using uh, methamphetamines, that too is a really um, kind of lights up um, the limbic system. And I'm going to talk about the limbic system more on the next page because it also has to do a, a lot around trauma. The brainstem is bodily functions, and those are things like breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, fluid balance. They're not things we have to really think about. They're things that just happen. So you know how when in courses we talk about a biopsychosocial uh, reason for using substances, the brainstem is the biological, the limbic system is the psychological, and the cortex is the social. So again, um, I hope that makes sense. Let's look at the limbic system though, and I think this is important. So you can see in the middle that as we said, the limbic system really is the site for, it's actually the site for all, all psychoactive drugs will affect the limbic system. And again, most drugs of use really kind of light up the limbic system. Some of the, one of the reasons I put this here is a couple of, a couple of reasons. One is you could see where it says like right below, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see amygdala and hippocampus. Uh, why do we need to know that? The amygdala is the part of your brain, which is the fight or flight or freeze. 
And so you want to have an amygdala that's working. Why? Because if you get into a dangerous situation, um, it's important for you to react. It's next to the hippo hippocampus, though, and the hippocampus is the part of the brain that gives it context. What does that mean in plain English? Sometimes you can be out and let's say you're in a very dangerous situation and your body says or your brain says run or fight or whatever it says. Um, what will happen is that the hippocampus will give it context. Where does that get played out? If you're working with veterans, for example, from Iraq or Afghanistan or even Vietnam, uh, what happens sometimes too is that for some people when they've experienced trauma, and this could be a lot of the young people who you're working with as well, that the amygdala and the hippocampus become dysregulated. What does that mean? That means that sometimes a person, you know, they might be on a train or they might hear a loud noise on the street and all of a sudden, even though it's a truck or a train, all of a sudden they think they're back in Iraq and Afghanistan. So a lot of the medications actually are some of the healing methods uh, for working with veterans um, are in there. Another thing too is that the sense of smell is in the limbic system. And what do we know? For those of you who are counselors, you know that the sense of smell is a really important one in terms of triggers. Um, and the sense of smell, you know, it's something that kind of stays with you. So for example, actually, I am going to ask you some questions because I've been talking about, I've been talking most of the time. So here's a question. Um, think about when you were a child, uh, what was a good smell that you remember? What was a good smell that you remember? I know I've got a lot of people, but if people would write that in, I think that'd be kind of cool. We've got 174 people. All right, I might not be able to read them all, but all right, so I've got pizza, jasmine, Mom's banana bread, cookies, baking cookies. These also, oh, pine salt, huh? lemon, Avon, animal soap, Christmas morning breakfast, chocolate chip cookies. Seems like there's a lot of things around baking and lilacs or flowers or your grandmother's house. So you can actually, all the all those you can see, by the way, so I won't read them all, but you can see, oh, I'm getting hungry just looking at them, uh, which speaks to, by the way, when you do relapse prevention groups to be careful about what you share, because uh, it may trigger people. Oh, bacon. All right, you can see them. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm laughing because I can tell which ones I like and which ones um I, I I don't, but they all are, they all seem good to me. Now, why did I ask that question? The reason I asked the question is because the sense of smell stays with you. So, for example, pick some. You know, for those of you who said that something smelled like bacon or something uh, that cakes were baking in your house, or um, and again, a lot of these are cultural as well. Or uh, those smells remind you of good things. Guess what? 50 years later, you may be walking down the street somewhere else and you smell lavender or you smell banana bread. And guess what? You're going to remember where you first experienced that. And so it's why actually smells can be really a trigger for people. But I purposely, by the way, asked you to put smells that were associated with positive things. Uh, just to kind of, I guess, because that's what I wanted to um, focus on. But um, again, so limbic system, again, all of the feelings that we um, experience um, on that. Thanks, everybody, for sharing all of those. And uh, I'm on the East Coast, so I didn't eat lunch yet. But now, I'm, although I am drinking coffee, I have to admit, but uh, think of all the things that uh, that you see there. Thanks for writing them in, everybody. So limbic system, again, it's about pleasure and it's about all the emotions. And again, if you're working with people who've experienced trauma, both young and old, um, it, the limbic system has been uh, impacted on that. All right, so let's move on. So why do we need to look at these um, neurotransmitters? And we'll start to look at, by the way, um, each of them in uh, great detail, but here's the, the drug effects on neurotransmitters. So they increase the levels of neurotransmitters. So if you're working with people 
who are using methamphetamines or cocaine or heroin, actually they'll, they increase the levels of neurotransmitters and that's why sometimes they feel so good. Um, that's not my commercial to do them, but I think we have to realize for people that they do feel good, at least they feel good at the beginning or people wouldn't um, use them. So they increase the levels of neurotransmitters. Now, in some cases, they decrease, they lower the levels of neurotransmitters. There's one called GABA, which I may not go into so much in the course, but it's often implicated with um, alcohol and benzodiazepines like Valium and Xanax, and it really decreases neurotransmitters. And actually, that's why sometimes initially they um, lower anxiety. Now, what, what else do neurotransmitters do? Sometimes they mimic or imitate other neurotransmitters. So for those of you working in methadone clinics, or for those of you who are in prevention programs with children, but their parents are in methadone programs, um, it also says that, so for example, heroin and methadone um, are kind of work, to, work together, or maybe it's the opposite. Um, so that what happens is methadone goes into those opioid receptors, remember those pictures I showed you, and it blocks the message. So it mimics the other neurotransmitters, and that way what's supposed to happen is if people use heroin, they won't feel it. And generally they don't, although I know people kind of play with a variety of things around that, but that's one of the reasons why methadone works. Another thing too is that number four is it blocks access to um, receptor sites. So it blocks it, it occupies the receptor, but it really doesn't activate them. So why does naltrexone work? Uh, why do some of the other medications work that uh, like buprenorphine is because they block access um, and actually not the other ones, definitely naltrexone blocks the, um, it occupies the receptor site and so it blocks, people won't feel it. All right, so what we'll do then is All right, we're gonna look at a variety of neurotransmitters and uh, we will look at them, each of them in uh, greater detail. So we'll look at norepinephrine, we'll look at dopamine, we'll look at serotonin, we'll look at endorphins, um, we'll look at acetylcholine. All right, we'll look at each of them in greater detail. And on this one, by the way, I will probably start to ask you to write in things. So what do we know about norepinephrine? Um, here's a couple of things. Norepinephrine is like adrenaline in the brain. What does that mean? Um, when you do something that accesses norepinephrine, it gives you that fight or flight response. So again, to use that example of being in a dangerous situation, what happens is your body gets into that, uh, it increases adrenaline in other parts of the, uh, of the body, but it increases norepinephrine in the brain. And what does it do? It helps you focus your concentration so that you can figure out what you need to do. And um, in the brain stem, it increases metabolic rate, heart rate, blood pressure, strength, and energy. So you ever hear of stories where somebody sees their child run over by a car and it's a woman who's 90 pounds and really weak and she can lift off the, the car off her child? Um, that is adrenaline and norepinephrine. So it gives people strength that they might not have had, but it's also why when you're in a dangerous situation, guess what, guess what happens? Your heart starts to beat. Uh, you feel like your metabolism is going quickly. Uh, your blood pressure increases, and that's because of norepinephrine. Now, the limbic system, what norepinephrine does is that high levels are associated with euphoria or pleasure. And here's a couple of things about that. Think about things you like to do that are dangerous. You don't have to write this in, by the way. But if you like to go on roller coasters, if you like to go skateboarding or if you go downhill skiing, what happens is it's a little scary. And so what happens is that it increases norepinephrine. And what do people find with that? They go, ooh, I want to do that again. So I'll probably ask you later on or in this in this segment what to do for that. But I think it's important um, to look at. And then in the cortex, it helps you focus your concentration. And that's why, again, why when you're in a dangerous situation, because it also, for example, 
if you're in a dangerous situation, it turns off like your hunger. So for example, if you're running down the street, um, you're not going to say, to, to avoid some dangerous situation, you're not going to be saying, oh, I think I'll stop for a bagel or something. Um, it makes you actually not hungry. And that's why some of those drugs of use that increase norepinephrine take away appetite, at least at the beginning. Um, other things about the cortex is if you have too much norepinephrine, that levels that are too high are associated with vigilance. So yeah, I see the question about is increased norepinephrine associated with anxiety? Yes. Yeah, what is the relationship between cortisol and norepinephrine? Uh, also a good question. So cortisol is also uh, produced uh, when people are anxious and so is norepinephrine. And I know that cortisol levels can be measured. So for example, sometimes you're working with somebody who's ex experienced a lot of abuse, they may have high cortisol levels. And I think that's important to either get treated or to figure out some of the non, uh, you know, simpler ways that we can do it. And I'm just going to take a look at uh, my notes because I think here's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, sometimes people like to be in that state, you know, do you ever do this where I don't know if anybody's an athlete out there or if you're following sports. A lot of times they'll use that term in the zone. You know, if a basketball player is, quote, in the zone, they see the basket as being um, maybe 10 feet in diameter. So what happens in a game when one player is making a lot of baskets, they feed the basketball to that person. So anybody who's in the zone, I remember one of the football players Actually, he used to play for the Jets. Sorry, I know the Jets are not doing too well for those of you from New York and New Jersey, but he talked about how he, um, when he got the ball, he was so in the zone that he could see every, every uh, space where he could run. Sorry, that's not a funny one, by the way, because I should have picked a different sport or a different team. I apologize. So somebody said, can you repeat the relationship between cortisol and norepinephrine. Um, yes, yeah, so cortisol actually, I think, is a um, is you know, it's produced in other parts of the body. Uh, they're similar. Norepinephrine is is, is uh, produced in the brain, um, and cortisol levels. I think cortisol is a hormone, and it's associated again with stress. And sometimes people have high cortisol levels if they've undergone a lot of stress. I also think, by the way, depending on where you live, and I know we have people from all over the world, generally in New York City, I think we are used to high norepinephrine rates because you're kind of always walking in the street, always paying attention to what's going on. <laughs> and um, we might have higher norepinephrine rates. So yeah, you know what else? <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the reasons is that I talked about making this simple is that you could probably go into great detail about different kinds of hormones that are produced. Um, and part of what I'm doing is the kind of the keep it simple thing. So when we talk about a neurotransmitter being accessed, it's not just that's the only thing that's not happening, but other hormones are also acting together. And that's what cortisol is doing as well. So I hope that makes um, more sense. If I didn't, you can write that in again. Um, going back to norepinephrine is that, I, you know, I was talking about when people are in the zone, any athlete is in the zone. It, you know, and also sometimes what happens is everything kind of slows down. There, there are tons, sometimes people will tell you they were in an accident, a car accident, and they said all of a sudden everything started to slow down. And part of it is that the norepinephrine is helping them focus their concentration. Now, a couple of things too, I think to know is that the older antidepressants, if you've been in the field for a while, it used to increase levels of norepinephrine. Why? Because if you were dealing with depression, it gave again, people some um, pleasure. Now, let's take it to um, young people. And here's something you can tell me about. So how many of your young people like video games? Now that's a stupid question because it's probably um, a lot of people, but video games will increase norepinephrine, right? And that's why I think people get kind of hooked on them uh, because 
I was thinking during the quarantine, if you don't have a lot to do, and again, many of you are in different parts of the country and maybe dealing with the quarantine differently, but if you have to kind of stay in your house or many people are going to school online, what are you going to do for fun? What are you going to do for excitement? So video games will increase norepinephrine. And that's why I think people get kind of hooked on them. I think skateboarding also increases norepinephrine. Bungee jumping, I'm not sure who's doing that, but uh, those are all things that will increase norepinephrine. Um, certain jobs, by the way, are high level. I think jobs that produce norepinephrine generally. So if you've ever, um, if you're related to a firefighter, a policeman, or you can write this in, by the way, there are other jobs I think that also have a lot of stress in them. And again, people get hooked on them. If you ever talk to, say, a firefighter who has retired, sometimes, or anybody who has had a high energy, scary job retires, they sometimes get really bored and have to figure out something else to do. Um, also, I'm going to use another sports example. So I don't know if I have any sports fans out there, but you know how sometimes you're watching a game and it's a blowout. So one team is winning by 50 points. And what do we say? You know, it's boring. Let me change the, the channel. Let me look at something else. But if you've looked at some of the, I'm going to say some of the NBA games, which lately have been, uh, Oh, yeah, somebody, yes, somebody's norepinephrine. Yes, we did. We did. Oh, we spelled it wrong. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. Pinephrine. It should be P-H-R-I-N-E, and it's abbreviated um, N-E. I'm sorry I missed that. Um, going back to those football games or those basketball games, some of those basketball games that are decided in the last two seconds or three seconds, if, you, if it's your team or if it's not your team, they, people find them exciting. Why? Because they are, um, it's, it's all that norepinephrine um, going on. Also, another thing too is that sometimes, you know, when they talk about that addiction to excitement, if you grew up well, not you. Let's if somebody grew up in a family where there was a lot of fighting um, or a lot of violence, then the child is off and on all the time. Does it make sense? So if you're dealing with somebody who kind of appears to have high norepinephrine, it may be that they get used to it. And what happens again is they get into this thing around addiction to excitement because they're used to having high levels of um, of norepinephrine. Yes, people are writing in. Yeah, artists experience the same zone. Yes. And musicians, definitely. Um, so again, it helps them um, concentrate. And, um, you know, it's interesting when I worked in drug treatment, a lot of musicians and artists were very scared about giving up the substance that they use because they felt that their creativity was just from the substance. Uh, it really isn't, by the way, it's from their soul or from their heart, but their perception, by the way, was that it, um, that it was. So norepinephrine is um, an important one. Now, if you want to increase your norepinephrine and not get into dangerous situations, by the way, um, nutritionally, and actually this can be for young people, and it also can be for actually people of all ages. If you eat foods that are high protein, you will increase norepinephrine. So what does that mean? I used, when I taught at NYU, I used to tell my students, you know, if you're going to sit for one of those five-hour exams, before you go on that exam, don't eat a lot of high carbs because you'll probably fall asleep through the test. But if you eat some chicken or some fish or eggs, you know, and not a lot of high fat stuff that will help you focus your concentration. And that actually has been, there's been research on that um, as well. So when you want to eat well, or you're teaching people about nutrition, that um, high protein actually increases alertness. All right, so that's norepinephrine. And again, the drugs that are associated with that, actually I have to say caffeine, but definitely cocaine, um, methamphetamines, a lot of the stimulant drugs. All right. All right, let's do dopamine. So dopamine, okay, I think I spelled that right. And the, it is abbreviated DA. So you'll see that in uh, some of the, uh, the different kinds of uh, research articles. 
So let's talk about what it does. But let me just, just say is that most drugs of use affect dopamine. And here's what it does in the brain. So it's the, it's the uh, actually it's the neurotransmitter of pleasure, but it also in the brain stem deals with fine motor control and functioning. So fine motor control, again, as I was saying before, um, if you can, actually, if you can hold a pen, if you're taking notes with a pen, or even with a computer, if you're taking notes um, and you're using your fingers, that is fine motor control. Um, in the limbic system, it stimulates pleasure and reward sites. And that's why, again, people like to use some of the substances or find things that are pleasurable um, because it will stimulate uh, and hit really like light up the limbic system. And the cortex, in the cortex, it will help with attention span, mental stability, and, and organization. Now, for those of you who are working with people with attention deficit disorder, and I forgot to say this with norepinephrine, but uh, the medications that work on helping people with attention dis de deficit disorder, they are stimulants. So they increase the level of norepinephrine and they increase the levers, sorry, the levels of dopamine. And I remember my first job out of college, I was a teacher, an English teacher, and I had uh, special ed students. And this was before everybody was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. So out of maybe 140 students, there were 10 people, 10 young people who had attention deficit disorder, and they were on, at the time, I got, it was Ritalin, now people are using Adderall and a variety of things. And um, what I think was um, important was, or what was, what I didn't know because I was 21, I thought, why are they giving people a stimulant drug when they can't really sit still? I thought it was like the stupidest thing I, I had ever heard. And then later on, I learned that if it increases the level of dopamine and norepinephrine, what does it do? See in the cortex, it helps with attention span. It helps with people to organize. Um, so that's one of the logic of why they, um, why they work. All right, I'm just reading to some other people. Oh yeah, I know, uh, yes, my friend, that some artists and musicians first got into the zone while on drugs, so they continue to associate. Yes, they do, and that's, I think, uh, a lot of the challenge. Um, many people who were writing songs, books, they were using substances, and they, they fear that if they don't have the substance, they won't be able to write or produce. Oh, somebody said, um, you know, at, at some point, by the way, this will be a recording, but I do have to tell you that we have to transcribe what we say, and that may take about two months. But but if you have to leave early, um, you'll you will get copies of the uh, you can still get copies of the slides sent to you. All right. So let me see what I have on dopamine. So a couple of things. Ah, how do we access dopamine? If you are on Instagram and somebody hits like on your account, guess what? It accesses dopamine or Facebook, depending on where you are. Um, here's some other ways. Well, I'm gonna give you the healthier ways first. Um, music, for anybody who likes music, you know how sometimes you hear good music and you go, ah, and it could be any music, by the way. I know a lot of literature says classical, but you know, for example, there's a lot of music that you like and it just gets you in a different space. That is dopamine. For those of you who've had babies or remember when you did have babies, you know how sometimes baby blankets on the, on the sides, they're, they're lined with satin? Um, that's an opportunity, by the way, for the baby to start feeling the pleasure of the satin, and that's what it's doing. And I'll talk about that later on about um, babies and when neurochemicals really begin. Um, a couple of other things. Let's see what um, I have here. Oh, there's a lot of other healthy ways to increase dopamine. So groups. So for those of you who are who are running groups or for those of you who go to 12-step groups or any kind of group and you feel, ah, that is dopamine. Another one is helping people. And you know, sometimes we live or we work and we don't always feel so cool about it. And then other times you help somebody and you kind of go, oh, that feels really good. Dopamine. Um, other ways, giving massages. 
also gives uh, dopamine and again, higher protein uh, as far as foods. One of the things we know for those of you who work in, with people with schizophrenia is that people with schizophrenia may have too much dopamine. And you know that sometimes they can't organize things. So you see where it says that under the cortex, what do we do? We give people a medication that lowers dopamine. And then what are some of the side effects? Look at the brainstem. So fine motor control or different kinds of side effects. And so um, then of course, if there's side effects, we give people another medication to deal with the side effects. So that's, I think about um, dopamine. Uh, you want to have pleasure in your life, by the way, and it could be anything. Whenever they used to have, I know NIDA had these movies, and they're talking about dopamine, and then they have like a hot fudge sundae, which could be one of my drugs of choice, but chocolate. But it would speak to, again, what do you do to have pleasure in your life? And if you're thinking, is she, is she thinking sex? Yes, that will increase dopamine as well. But you want to actually have dopamine in your life or figure out what you can do. Now, if you're setting up a program for adolescents, you can think that out as well of how you can help them access dopamine. All right, let's go to another one. All right, let's go to serotonin, which is abbreviated 5-HT. And you may have heard of serotonin a lot. Somebody wrote a book about the serotonin collect co connection. And serotonin really, um, it, it deals with mood. So if you don't have a lot of serotonin, you're gonna be in a bad mood. Uh, if you have, let me go through the brainstem, limbic system, and cortex, and then I'll tell you some of the other things I have um, on my notes here. So, on the brainstem, it regulates sleep and appetite. So, what foods do you think have serotonin? You don't have to write this in, but warm milk, turkey, actually carbohydrates in general have and give you serotonin. In the limbic system, it regulates mood, and they're connected, right? Because if you haven't been sleeping, are you in a good mood or are you in a bad mood? And in the cortex, they say it's the interpretation of sensory input, which they're not totally sure what it does, by the way, but they think that LSD actually will impact um, serotonin. So you need to have um, serotonin. Here's a couple of things uh, I think also to add is that actually serotonin will stabilize your mood. Um, it sometimes reduces compulsive behaviors. And they found, by the way, that people who are born or who have depression and eating disorders have low serotonin. Hmm. So I think that's kind of interesting to me. And when you look at kind of the medications, you can work with that. So that's why the antidepressants, like the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, what they do, going back to that picture that I showed at the beginning, is um, they block the reuptake, and that means that the, um, the serotonin is in the synapse, and it continues to stay there, and it helps regulate somebody's mood. Now, for foods, what can you eat? If you eat foods that are high in carbohydrates, you increase serotonin. So, you know, for example, for anybody who likes pasta, oh yeah, fermented foods, yes, too. For anybody who likes pasta or rice and beans, you know how sometimes you go out and you, um, or you have like a bowl of pasta or, um, or rice and beans and you feel really good and then maybe 20 minutes later you start to feel sleepy? Um, that's because actually, you've increased your serotonin. So it's good, by the way. It's why sometimes it's good to eat those at night. And I'm not a nutritionist, by the way, but I just know that from what I've read and from what I've studied, that sometimes it's helpful um, to eat high, higher carbs at night rather than in the middle of the day. So it really will help with your mood. But what I, again, going back to what I used to tell my students, you don't want to eat a lot of pasta or rice and beans before you sit for some of those exams because you'll feel good, but you might be sleepy. So I don't know if that makes sense to people, but that's like a that is a kind of a nutritional thing um, that you can do. Again, if you have any questions or you want to add to that, please do. And I appreciate other people um, adding in. All right, here's another favorite of, of mine, endorphins. 
Now, we know that endorphins are kind of the endogenous morphine that we have, and we have them to deal with pain. And some people are born with a lot of endorphins, some people not so much. And women are supposed to have better endorphin systems than men, by the way, uh, because they want to deal or need to deal with childbirth. So for those of you who've had children, the endorphins may have kicked in, or maybe you had low ones to begin with and they, uh, they didn't, but that's the way it, it, it's supposed to um, be. So in the brainstem, it inhibits pain, slows motor response. And again, I'm gonna use uh, athletes, for example, a football player gets hurt and if they're not carted off um, in one of those uh, little truck, those little golf carts, um, they'll always encourage them to keep walking uh, because if you keep walking, um, it'll deal with the pain. It'll hurt later on, but uh, the idea is that it will inhibit the pain and slow motor response. In the limbic system, it can cause euphoria and again, reduce pain and help control stress. Sounds like some of the things that we need these days, right? And the, in the cortex, it may uh, reduce compulsive behaviors. So it's our pain regulating, regulating system and um, I think it's important, uh, I'll, I'll look at my, I can tell you about nine ways you can improve or increase your endorphins. By the way, some of you have known me from trainings, have heard this before. You know, just by the way, in terms of history, uh, Helen of Troy, when she was dealing with the Trojan War, she gave her soldiers opium. Now what, opium, by the way, creates endorphins. Heroin creates a lot of endorphins and the reason she gave them the opium was because one, they might have gotten hurt, and also it even uh, they would see their friends get hurt, and they would have no feelings uh, about it. So it was really kind of this thing to um, dull um, the the pain. Now, for those of you who work in methadone, uh, one of the things of why long-term methadone works for some people is that. Some people may have been born with low endorphin systems to begin with. And then when they get heroin or they start using heroin, I've heard this a lot. They'll say, oh, heroin, I feel normal at the first time. And so sometimes when they get off heroin, they feel terrible and methadone can help that. Another thing that happens too is that if your body's pretty smart, it knows that if endorphins, if you're bringing in endorphins with heroin, it says, you know what, I don't think I have to make so much anymore because I'm getting some good ones from outside. So it's why, again, how long does it take for them to get better? My trainer answer is it depends. So um, some people heal quicker than others. Some people never heal. So, um, I'm going to ask you for examples, but I'm going to tell you, you could add to this, by the way, here are ways for you to increase your endorphins. Uh, let me say too that depending on, you know, what you've been doing in the quarantine, and I, I will, I'll share something personal. You know, I've, as soon as the quarantine started, I tried to walk three miles a day. So I'm like, okay, this is cool with the endorphins, but I'm still feeling a little bit out of it. And so then I started doing Zumba once a week and all of a sudden my endorphins were increasing. So now I'm up to twice a week. And I think it's a combination of actually dancing and also dancing for an hour. And it's also the music. So um, it's a combination of things, but uh, everybody has to figure out for themselves what you like to do. So the, here's some natural ways. Uh, let me say too, the last time I did this course, uh, people ask me if I could send them my notes. And so I will say on the very last slide, you'll have my email address. And if you want me to send you, I think, two pages of my notes, I'd be glad to do that because it'll include all of these things that are not up there. So here's some natural ways. All right, we know exercise. And it's exercise for 20 minutes. Um, it, you can walk, you could dance, you could swim, you could do whatever you like to do. Uh, but if you don't like to exercise, here's some others. One is prayer. Some of you know this. Meditation. Um, orgasms. These are not in any special order, by the way, but it's um, so good sex. Uh, receiving massages is another way. Hot baths. Acupuncture. You know that acupuncture has been used 
in actually detoxing or withdrawing people from the substances. Here's another one, laughing. Oh, thank you. Somebody wrote that in there before me. So yes, laughing increases endorphins. So that is a really um, important one. I'll add a couple more. Um, hot foods, hot meaning uh, you use the hot sauce. And now why is that? Because if you eat something with a lot of hot sauce on it and you feel pain in your mouth, it increases endorphins. So if you find, by the way, that you are uh, attached to um, the hot sauce or you find it very pleasurable, you're increasing your endorphins. Another thing too, and this again is for young people, actually young people of all ages, but if you find somebody who's cutting themselves or harming themselves, um, often what they're trying to do, by the way, is um, they're trying to, sometimes what happens in terms of the background is they have some abuse situations and they don't feel anything. And when they cut themselves or burn themselves or whatever they choose to do in terms of self-harm, they feel pain. And when they feel pain, they feel endorphins. So I think it's kind of important to kind of look at that, that when somebody is cutting, and you're telling them, stop it. And I know some of you are counselors, by the way, who would do that. Be aware that the endorphins will decrease. And I'm not saying, by the way, and you know, to tell people to keep doing it, but just be aware of, of what goes on physically for some people. Um, I heard another story, and this is a little bit of an aside, but it was a story on culture that was a real mistake. And there was a young man, he was in 10th grade, and he's African-American and he was cutting himself. And he went to the guidance counselor and the guidance counselor didn't believe him. The guidance counselor thought it was just a gang thing. Um, and so really didn't pay attention. And guess what? The person was, the young man was harming himself. Um, so be aware that that's one of those examples about where if the person had thought about it from a well, a different, a correct cultural response, they would have had a whole different uh, story, a whole different treatment plan. So those are mine. Are, are there things, by the way, that you, actually, I will we'll ask you to write in since you've been sitting listening to me again. What do you do to increase your endorphins? Nobody has to share anything personal, but what do you do to increase your endorphins? Dance. And again, you can all read each other, so I won't Oh yeah, actually, um, in in terms of the BDSM community, yes, uh, that is uh, so. Sadomasochistic sex actually will increase endorphins as well. Run, music, hiking. Well, cool. and you can again. I'm not going to read them. I think you can read them yourselves. I think what's pretty cool is there's a variety of things that people are doing. Oh yeah, I think people are struggling struggling with exercising, but also eating. <laughs> what is that, that pandemic 15? Yeah, and gardening, by the way, also not in just not just increases endorphins, but also dopamine, kind of the touching of the, uh, when your hands kind of touch the ground or the, the earth, that can be helpful. Uh, by the way, reading increases uh, dopamine. And actually learning, these are all good things uh, people are doing. Oh, surfing. All right, so you can see, I think the key, by the way, and actually, because one of the questions I'm going to ask too is, since this is the PTTC, Prevention Technology and Transfer Center, for those of you who are working in prevention programs, how can you use this information? And I still have one more to go through, by the way, of the acetylcholine, but how can you start to use that? Oh, yeah, the hot tub will do it. Sewing. And sewing also increases uh, dopamine. So when people have repetitive movements, and that's why sometimes people like sewing and or um, needlepoint or knitting, why people find that in pottery. Why these are great things, by the way. So then the question is, for those of you working in prevention, 
how do your prevention programs, what are you adding to your prevention programs that help the people you're working with? What are you doing in terms of your prevention programs to use some of this information? Oh yeah, mindfulness, that's a big one, by the way. Um, and teaching that early on is excellent. Oh, these are cool, Youth Gardening Club. Asking, asking youth, I am going to read some of these, by the way, even though everybody can see them, but working with all kinds of activities they like to do, planning, adding a dance segment to a group activity, breathing techniques. And that's another one, again, with mindfulness, which is really important. There's a lot of information by the literature on mindfulness and substance use. Oh, Alaska, cool. Summer work program at, oh, working on a farm. Yes, that's great. Arts and crafts activities. Going to the boardwalk. Yeah, using music as a background, by the way, is also really um, helpful. Thanks, as people are writing in the toolbox of options, coloring, grooming horses. That should makes me want to do that. Chess, dance club, step team. And again, those are, you hear endorphins when I hear that. And also um, if people are focusing their concentration like with, with chess, um, that's another, again, norepinephrine in a healthy way and dopamine. So thank you for writing those in. The key, by the way, is for you to figure out what works for you. All right, another one, this will be the, the last one we'll do. And I put this in, by the way, acetylcholine which is abbreviated ACH because it is also associated with marijuana. I'm reading what, watching Dancing with the Star. Oh, so watching lots of things. Cool, thank you everybody for writing those in. So acetylcholine, and again, it's accessed a lot with, uh, with marijuana. And so in the brain stem, it affects motor control, muscular reflexes, sleep, a lot of things, right? Blood pressure, heart rate, and fluid balance. Uh, so, you know, when you hear about something affecting fluid balance, it's why, for example, you take a drug and, and people have dry mouth. So people will talk about complaining about that. If you smoke weed, you get a dry mouth or some of the medications that people are given or prescribed will also create a um, dry mouth. So that's all from the brain stem. From the limbic system, it affects perception, mood, aggression, and sexual activity. And in the cortex, it affects memory and information storage. Uh, one of the reasons I put that there, by the way, is because sometimes one of the side effects of uh, marijuana is that if it lowers your acetylcholine, what do you do? You have poor short-term memory. Not necessarily long-term memory, but definitely short-term memory. Another thing I tell my students before an exam, if you're gonna smoke weed, wait till after the class. I actually, I didn't say it like that, but I would say, can't remember exactly what I said. I didn't wanna to sound too judgmental and old, but uh, thinking you wouldn't wanna smoke marijuana before you took an exam because it can affect your short-term memory. So I think that's important um, to look at. And um, for example, if people have unbalanced acetylcholine, they may have tremors or memory lapses. And another thing too, and this is kind of an, an aside, but nerve gases. So you know when you hear of those nerve gases that are used in some of the wars or in some countries, they impact acetylcholine. So what happens is the gases that are given to people, they impact motor control, meaning you can get you can get hit by I think I can't remember the names of some of them, but you get if you're hit by them, you can't walk. And then if you're a soldier and you can't walk, you get shot. Um, another thing too, by the way, is that 
exterminators. This may be something you don't need to know, but um, when people do extermination, like if they come to your house to get rid of uh, uh, cockroaches or something, those kind of, uh, those things will actually, they have acetylcholine. So what'll happen is when the person, you spray whatever on the bug, um, it doesn't kill it necessarily, but it stops it from running and then you step on it. So I don't know if you have to be in New York to, to um, appreciate that. But, uh, and I, I said this once when I, when I was living in New York, I, um, I was saying to one of the exterminators, hey, what, what do you know about acetylcholine? This is what I heard. And he was like, how did you know that? And he said it was true. So it's something to keep in mind. Another thing about acetylcholine is that for women, estrogen is related to actually the loss of estrogen is related to lower levels of acetylcholine. And that for some women during menopause, what do they complain about? Not being able to remember anything. So those are, oh good, I'm glad, because these are things, you know, you can talk about, you can actually teach this to your clients as well as students and help them figure out, you know, what, what they want to um, do. So I have another piece on, it's called neuroplasticity. Now, when I first started in the field, or even as I've been through, uh, you know, different parts of uh, of training is that sometimes we'd say, oh, if you've been using this drug, your brain's never going to get better. Um, if you've been using cocaine, it's going to take, you know, 20 years for it to get better. We never said 20, by the way, I'm exaggerating, but sometimes people would say 10 years for it to get back. Um, and then with methamphetamines, people said when they first came out and people were going into treatment, the thought was that the brain would never get better. But let me go on, on, uh, let me just say that that's not true anymore, that here's what we know. And actually, I was at a training that Dr. Uh, Christopher Blazes did. It was one of those, uh, it was in San Diego. It was in San Diego. I was in my apartment in Bimaranek. But what he talked about neuroplasticity, and he said that the brain has a capacity to adapt. And I was like, good, good. Because we used to worry, you know, from a vocational point of view, is sometimes if your brain certain parts of your brain was destroyed. And maybe before you started using substances, you had an eighth grade reading level and then you'd go into a training program and you couldn't do it. Or think about, again, going back to students, for young people, where are they in terms of their learning and how does that impact uh, where um, they are? Oh yeah, somebody said, what about PT I mean, PTSD? Yeah, um, actually there is some hope for that. Um, we probably do a whole training on that, but um, one of the things is that for post-traumatic stress disorder, some people, by the way, guess what? They go back on their own or they have a, you know, they eat well, they exercise, they do things. Other people take medications. And another thing that's helpful with post-traumatic stress disorder is an intervention called EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprogramming. Um, you can you can email me about that and I'll tell you more about it. But the, uh, the good news is that, again, the brain can rebuild to recovery. So now what happens is the neurons are destroyed. They can't rebuild, but your body adapts and still can start to do ultimately with not so much with well with treatment and with taking good care of oneself. Uh, it, it's an important piece. Um, it's also why, though, by the way, like Dr. Blaze is at his facility, they really, it's in uh, New Mexico, and they really focus a lot on holistic health. So not, so they look at people from a biopsychosocial spiritual model. Um, they also have um, a lot of different kind of activities. Um, they work with um, some of the reservations around healing practices. So there's a whole variety of things that they do. So neuroplasticity, again, the brain can, it can recover. Um, and again, I, to me, you know, they show pictures in some of those NIDA movies that you see, or actually you can go on uh, some TED Talks or YouTube and look at that. Um, the key, by the way, in, is that the reward circuit, you know, is that some of people start using substances, why? To seek pleasure, yep, and to avoid pain. 
And then what happens is after a while, uh, people will, they don't like the drug anymore, but they still want it. And you've heard that um, a lot um, as well. Um, somebody was asking about serious TBI, traumatic brain injury. First of all, I think, thank you for asking about that. Traumatic brain injury, I, you know what I have to say is that it depends. But I think what's important is there's a high correlation between traumatic brain injury and substance use. Um, taking it back to younger people, people might have gotten beat up in the house or hit in the head a lot. Um, so I think it's important to look at. Um, I'm going to say you really need to speak to somebody about TBI because some things will help and some things will not. Um, same thing with Parkinson's as somebody uh, wrote in. Unfortunately, Parkinson's is still a chronic illness and I think you can, again, I'm not a doctor and if somebody close to my family who has it, who's been struggling, you know, we always used to tell her, you better walk, you better do something. And she, you know, she does. And of course, again, what we tell people to do, it's like what you wouldn't do so much in treatment, but um, with Parkinson's, no, it's chronic. And so it's not going to rebuild as much as I know, by the way, but let me say, I'm not an expert on that. Um, but again, we can help people actually by stabilizing the system The the healthier things you do, the more your brain improves and changes. Oh, cool. Your aunt with Parkinson's took up boxing. That is so cool. I wish my sister had done that. Um, so it, it's just imp the, the take home on this, by the way, with neuroplasticity is that the brain can adapt. And a lot of it, again, is focused on substance use for young people um, and also for people of all ages. So one of the things, and this is one of the, I'm getting towards the, towards the end of my slides, but these are questions. I'm actually a couple of things. Here's some challenges for adolescents and from challenges for women. So for those of you who are working in prevention programs, here's what we know about adolescents. So neurotransmitters are developed when a child is around two. So for example, when a child is born, they don't have like a whole bunch of neurotransmitters. They're developed around two. And what do we know about children around two? They get into the terrible twos. And it's just a matter of their body kind of reacting to what's going on with them. So is it predictable? In some cases, in many cases, yes. Now, here's what happens though neurotransmitters decrease sharply when an adolescent is 13. Think about it for those of you working in prevention programs. So somebody is feeling okay when they're nine or 10 or 11, then all of a sudden their neurotransmitters decrease. And when they're 12 or 13, what do we know? You're working, you're dealing with kind of adolescent angst and what's going on. And that is something that I don't even have the words for it, but um, we, just as you know, and that's why actually a lot of young people deal with depression early on. You know, I work, uh, my job, as I said, is at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. And in the 1970s, guess what? A lot of the doctors did not diagnose adolescents with depression. Why? Because they didn't think that they were able to do that. They did not think that um, that adolescents had the ability or were okay with getting a diagnosis of depression. Now, it's like a lot of things in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We know that that is not true. Actually, so somebody just wrote in, there's a great resource for de degenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, what if there was a cure by Mary Newport, MD. And I think that's really cool, by the way, because I know that when people have written in things, I've gone to some of those sources and obviously you can all learn a lot from that. So just speaks to, again, adolescents, lots of anxiety, lots of depression. They do, this is true by the way, and you probably already knew this, but young people today are dealing with more depression and anxiety than in other areas. And why is that? And they have done research and a lot of it has to do with, um, with technology. So for example, a young person, let's say a young girl puts her picture up on a website and says, am I pretty? And then 8,000 people say, no, you're not, you're ugly. Um, that didn't happen for some of us when we were kids because 
we didn't have the uh, internet or you couldn't be if you were bullied you were only bullied during the day when you saw people you weren't bullied 24 hours uh 24 hours a day so i think that's important Yes, and thank you. Um, same thing with bipolar disorder. Most people don't want to diagnose, but medication is yet. I'm going to say medication is really needed for bipolar disorder. Um, in in my experience working out with hospitals and with other doctors, I know people who've tried to do it with acupuncture and things that hasn't worked. Although I know of some people, by the way, who have. I don't know. They've. I can't say they've cured themselves because there's no cure, but they know how to uh, deal with it. Yeah, so you can go on Netflix. Yeah, there's a lot, um, again, about youth depression and social media, but that is really a big thing. So however you choose to work on that, for those of you who are in prevention programs, but I think, again, we need to know that the neurotransmitters, taking it back to why we're doing this course, they really have um, decreased at the age of 13. All right, here's another thing for women. And, you know, it's talking about for women, estrogen is is uh, attached to acetylcholine, but women may be actually they are born with low lo lower levels of serotonin than men. So what does that mean? You see, for example, that more women are diagnosed with depression than men. Now I know there's a social piece to that, by the way, um, because sometimes it's like okay for women to talk about depression, and yet it's sometimes not a uh you know it's not cool for men I, I will use another sports example um and this is a cool one um the quarterback for the dallas cowboys Dak prescott was talking about how he was dealing with depression during the quarantine and he was uh, also his brother had committed suicide so he talked about it and then another a guy on another show said, oh, why is he doing that? He's the quarterback of one of the best teams. And then everybody actually went to support Dak Prescott on this. And there's a number of players in the NBA, National Basketball Association, have also have talked about mental illness. And I think it's a cool thing because uh, they're men. And in a lot of cases, they're African-American men or Latino men, or in some cases, white men. But it's men don't like to talk about it as much. Or socially, it's not always looked at. OK, let me see what people are writing. How does this sharp decrease in neurotransmitters affect the behavior? It may show up, by the way, as irritability, um, as depression, as anxiety. Yes, I learned that our brain prunes around age of three and 13. Yeah, and so it's, it's you can Google that later on about uh, the brain pruning, but the brain is changing and it, 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 it impacts neurotransmission to young people. Or pe that makes sense, right? So um, going back to may have low, I've already said, um, the have lower levels of um, serotonin. You know, somebody said, what's pruning of the brain? I'm going to say I don't have a good description of that right now. If somebody wants to Google it, go right ahead and then type it in. You know, it's something I say and I don't always uh, know, but I can't Google it right now. But if somebody wants to Google it, please do. I, I do know that it has to do with changes of the brain, but somebody can help me out on this one. Okay, because the next one We'll come back to that. Um, when you look at this information, oh, somebody said, I'm glad somebody asked. I always like when people ask, by the way, because sometimes what happens is when people ask, when one person asks, it means other people wanted to know, uh, but we're afraid to. And that's why, in fact, one of the reasons I always don't like uh, the ability to see everybody's questions on this is because if I'm in a training, I'm not sure I want to ask a question because I'm afraid people are going to think I'm stupid. So um, anyway, it's something to look. Okay, so we've got it. Thank you. Uh, synaptic pruning is a natural process that occurs in the brain between early childhood and adulthood. During synaptic pruning, the brain eliminates extra synapses. And synapses are the brain structures that allow the neurons to transmit an electrical or chemical signal to another neuron. 
Um, I can probably go back to that picture synaptic. Just remember the picture that the synaptic pruning. So the brain's eliminating the extra synapses. Ah. So um, I think that kind of explains why if the synapses aren't there, then the neurotransmitters can't go from one to another. And again, ultimately the body is going to heal itself, but it's going to be maybe something difficult. So as somebody also wrote in, it rids the excess to become more efficient. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everybody who um, wrote in. I'm going to say that's the first time I admitted, actually, I, if I'm in person, if I don't know the answer, I say I don't know the answer, and then we look it up. This is the first, time, you know, sometimes though when you're on a webinar, you're like, ooh, okay, thank you for looking it up. It still works. I appreciate that. So as we're getting to the end of the program, um, I'll just say, and this is one of the last slides before you can ask questions is, what do you think you can do with this information? So the idea was to present Neurochemistry 101 in a fairly, I hope, simple way. So the write-in can be, what can you do with this information for yourselves? And you could write in at the same time, and maybe it'll be the same thing. And what can you do for your clients? So some of you are working with adults, some of you are in prevention programs, but if people were just to write in and we can see what you're writing in, and I think that's helpful. So how can you use this information? Oh, change my diet. Sounds like it. Yeah, going back to the pruning, it sounds like that could be a contributing factor to the decrease of neurotransmitters, yes. Be aware of the things you're doing, putting into your body that affect your wellness. And you know, that's what wellness is really about. Awareness, thank you. Improve my understanding. The students I work with be less resistant to mental health support if they understand. And you know what? Students are smart. Uh, so I think sometimes letting them know. Yeah, if you teach a course, you know, we used to do this in our Substance Use 101 course. You're allowed to, by the way, use our slides, uh, which you'll get copies of because they're public domain. And again, I'll have my email there. And if you want, I will send notes, like two pages of notes to people who would like them. You know, and if this is new for um, new for you, by the way, you still have, here's what we have. If it's new information for you, I know from my own experiences, when I first learned this in grad school, I didn't understand it at all. And it took me going to a training where I was working for a while to figure um, that one out. So let's look at how people are gonna use this. Again, I'm, I'm appreciating that people will use this knowledge so that you can share it with your students. It'll help them make better decisions. Yeah, and again, with the notes, what I, what I said is I'll put my email, my email is on the last slide. And I know I did this last time is the day after the training, I did send out those notes to people. Understanding how neurotransmitters affect us can help us make better choices. Yep, and guide our clients to the idea of making better choices. Yes, helping people understand sometimes on why, oh, on why children are going through the emotional changes. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes, by the way, if you're, uh, as the person who wrote this, support some of the methods we're using with female substance abusers. Yes, so there's always, a, again, a neurochemical piece. Thank you. Share with that church congregation. Thank you. All right, somebody said teens always need proof. You bet. You know, it's interesting, somebody's writing here from that criminal justice system is sometimes we've done trainings for people in the criminal justice system. And sometimes I think it's helpful for them um, to know this um, as well. 
Yeah, it, somebody also wrote, can help increase the understanding of self. Yep, medicating, self-medicating, opening opportunities for healthier and more holistic practices. Yeah, definitely. I think it um, speaks to that. So, yeah, personal and personal wellness, by the way, some of you have heard me, or if you haven't heard me proselytize on the idea of taking care of yourself, because if you don't take care of yourself, you really can't take care of other people. And I know we say that all the time, but I think the quarantine is really, I don't know, maybe it's taught you more, I'm not sure, or it's taught us to deal with uh, another stressful situation and change. Oh, good. A question with increase in vaping, how does nicotine impact neurotransmitters? Good question. Um, nicotine increases um, norepinephrine, so it makes people more alert in, in the central nervous system. But what nicotine does in the peripheral nervous system is it makes people relaxed. And again, remember the peripheral ner nervous system is the rest of the body, not the brain and the spinal cord. And that's why sometimes when people smoke, they will say, you know, they smoke before they study and they say, well, here's what it did. It made me feel relaxed, but it also made me feel able to focus. So I think that's important. And the thing with vaping, and I think Diana's doing a training on vaping, is that with vaping, you're taking in a lot more, a lot more caffeine than you would with um, than in a cigarette and actually as i'm thinking people are also vaping marijuana so there's a lot of substance going into the lungs lungs are very very large and um, they can really uh, take in a lot so for younger people as well as for older people i think it's important uh, to know as well i hope I, that answered um, the question Oh yeah, the question was what, with the increase in vaping, how does nicotine impact? So I think I answered the question and um, it's why, again, I think it's important um, to look at um, as well. So other questions, somebody writes, I've heard that nicotine use by, binds to the acetylcholine receptors and it stops the production. Yes, it actually decreases acetylcholine. I still have I still have lots of time for questions, by the way, and um, I think the key, by the way, is uh, I was thinking it's like isn't there a saying that physician heal thyself? So do you need to take care of yourself first, as I said, and then also that can be helpful for your clients. All right, we had uh, outpatient treatment programs in our hospital nursing home. It started a sports group for older patients, both. On program at older because clips were from the 50s and got Walkman CD players for money donated and use music as a tool for young. You know, music is a tool that works um, really well. And if people want Walkmans or radios or whatever, uh, using Spotify, uh, whatever it is, I think it's important to help people um, figure that out. All right, other questions? What actions or drugs increase neuroplasticity? So here's a couple of things that can help with neuroplasticity. One is actually, if you're teaching people about changing the behaviors, the more you change the behavior, um, the better your brain gets. So for example, if people are used to using a substance and then they stop using the substance, and you help people stop using the substance that will increase neuroplasticity. Other things in general, if you look at it from a biopsychosocial spiritual way, is um, good nutrition will help with neuroplasticity. Actually going to counseling and dealing with issues and trauma will help with neuroplasticity. Actually, as somebody wrote in, actually sleep, sleep is an intervention that many of us don't think about, but is also an important uh, component of wellness. Another thing that can help with neuroplasticity, you know, I was saying that in some of the reservations, they're using different kinds of healing. Think about from either from your own cultures or whatever you do to deal with healing. And some of you are in faith-based 
um, organizations that will help with neuroplasticity as well. So it's you want to look at things biologically, psychologically, socially, and actually having groups, getting people together, although now we, I know we have to do it six feet away from each other, um, I think is important. Actually, somebody wrote in coconut and palm oil. Cool. I think, again, going for massages is also, remember, it increases endorphins. It also increases dopamine uh, if you give massages or you receive massages. And so um, I think there's a lot of things. Yes, my friend, I know that OTP is opioid treatment program for methadone, suboxone. Yes, thank you. So let's see, I'm looking at the clock. It's about 1.37. I still have um, time for questions. I was thinking, by the way, I may go backwards. I'm gonna go back because maybe at the beginning, remember I was showing those pictures. This is kind of just really looking at and maybe repeating that with dopamine binding. So we've got the two neurons. And again, you know, when people were talking about pruning, by the way, that um, actually it was getting rid of some of the, sy the synapses, that the synapses were those spaces in between the neurons. And so that's part of healing. Um, another part, too, and I want to just repeat this, is that receptor sites can get damaged. Why? They can get damaged because sometimes if people use a substance, I'm going to say like cocaine or methamphetamine, that the neurotransmitters, they really like bombard the receptor sites. And when the receptor sites um, are bombarded, they can be destroyed. And if you don't have receptor sites, then what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to experience that. But the receptor sites, again, can heal with people taking care of themselves. A medication in some cases, by the way, is helpful. And that's why some of the medications for depression, actually they balance the neurotransmitters and the synapse in that space. So I think um, that is important um, as well. So I just wanted to show that again. Um, some people, we used to say this in the old days, the, the receptor sites wouldn't come back, but we're finding again that they, they may. Um, but again, people have to take good care of themselves. Another thing too is that sometimes if there's a bombardment of neurotransmitters, the body will create more receptor sites. And that means when you get into recovery, you've got a lot of receptor sites and they're waiting for like cocaine, methamphetamine. And so that is something, again, all part of the brain working that ultimately um, helps. Uh, somebody said, what can you share about enzyme therapy for reward deficiency syndrome? Um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. Um, do you know more about that than I do? Um, enzyme, because I, I don't know about enzyme therapy. I just know that some of the medications, some of the antidepressants uh, will help regulate the enzymes. But I, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Through the slides, because I'm getting back to the end. So yeah, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. All right, so any more questions? I know it's a little bit early. What other questions can I answer? And I will stay on to answer questions, by the way. But let me say that too, and some of you know this, I always end my webinars with hope. And I was trying to think of something like different to say than what I usually think, but I, I think maybe a picture is worth a thousand words, so I don't have to say anything. But if you look at that, there is hope. Oh, some going back to that question, I understand that there are certain foods that contain needed proteins for forming the protein links for creating neurotransmitters. Yeah, I think it again, um, there's a lot of books out there on uh, nutrition. I'm going to say what I think it's important is to find a nutritionist also who knows what they're doing. I think one of the challenges with people, like if you go to 
a store that sells vitamins and you ask people for things like probiotics or whatever, uh, some of the people in the stores, they do not get training on this. So they just, you know, and I've done this before. I've done my anecdotal research. I've gone into some of those stores and say, somebody will say to me, well, you should take this. And then I say, well, what kind of training have you had? And they say none. So there's also the interesting thing, I think, with some of the, um, the herbs that you can buy is they're not regulated. So you don't always know what's in them. And so I think it's important for actually for your agency, maybe to connect with a good nutritionist. Um, and I know that they'll be, by the way, if you don't have money to hire a nutritionist is you could probably go to TED Talks um, and look under nutrition and you'll get some really good information. Uh, but yeah, I think as, as the person says that certain foods contain the proteins. It's important by the way to eat protein because protein really helps the brain. And so sometimes when diets have like low protein or low this or low that, uh, it really needs to be balanced. And I think that is important as well. Oh, here's some question I can answer. How do some psychotropic medications you know work? So for example, some of the um, like Prozac, Soloft, they are called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And really what they do is actually they balance serotonin in the, in, in the, um, in the synapse um, so that people will feel better. Um, what methadone does is it mimics heroin, but it goes into the receptor site. And when it gets into the receptor site, um, it binds to the receptor site. And so if you use heroin, you're not, you won't feel it. Um, Suboxone actually um, works a little differently. Um, it's called a partial agonist. And what that means is that when Suboxone goes into or the chemicals go into the receptor site, um, they still can get some of the feeling from the drug, but um, they partially block it. So me methadone will will fully, it's an, it's an agonist drug, it will fully uh, block heroin. Um, but other than that, um, sorry, uh, with uh, Suboxone, actually it's partial. So some goes through, but not enough to get high, allegedly. And um, it, so they, they are a little similar, but they're very, but they're different. 